Good morning, third speakers. Good morning, third speakers. Good morning. Come on. Good morning, third speakers. Something dies inside of you, right? You're done. Ah, fine. A disclaimer. This training is not meant as a politically correct, fair training towards the other speeches. This is a third speaker centric view. It comes into attitude. It looks at, you know, technique and stuff. But mainly, this is a third speaker room, a third speaker world. We look at things in a third speaker way. We're training to be third speakers. We are teaching to kill as third speakers, okay? Good. So in order for you to train as third speaker assassins, as fully capable killers of clash areas and arguments, that is the attitude you should have. You are the assassin, you are the killer, you make things happen in your third speech, you decide debates, you win them there and there. Then. Right. So we're going to look at a few things. We're going to look at what the outline of the debate is. We're going to look at techniques for killing effectively. And we're going to look at really what achieves the most kill value for a third speaker. Okay? So, it is a game of killing more of the enemy's arguments, of making sure you have the best trophies, best kills made out of the clash areas. So if you look at that debate in that way, we're the third speaker, we're the assassin, we're the kill maker. What does that make the first speaker? The first speaker is the scout. The first speaker gives us contest, gives us the lay of the land, installs our initial weaponry available there for us and gives us that context. Since the first speakers, the scouts from both teams, have already started playing, we look at that setup. We look at how the shape of the battlefield is being drawn up, what seems to be the direction the debate is going in, what is the context. That's what we want from a good first speaker. Good scouting, solid context establishing. We want to make sure that our scout gives us a clear direction that the debate is going in, puts our tools that we will need in the third speech well clearly established on the table, okay? What is the second speaker? The second speaker is our tracker. Now the second speaker should already be flagging the important bits, should already be showing our major targets, marking our targets through already initial attacks, should already be establishing what are the priority targets, should already be clarifying what weapons in our arsenal, in our case, are the important ones, the tracker should be sending the debate in a direction that is already going towards giving us what the essential kills are at the end of a debate, okay? So the tracker, the second speaker, for us, who are responsible for debate as third speakers, should do this tracking, this program. Prioritizing of what's important, is adding of extra weapons and establishing our previous weapons already even better in the debate. Okay? We're at number three. We're the assassin. <coughs> the debate is on us. It is up to us to win the debate. We're supposed to win it. By the time we're given the debate, no matter how good or bad it's been, we can decide. Because we have the full availability within our eight minutes to go into in-depth analysis on whatever we find essential. And because we have that time, we shall treat the least like it's all up to us. It's all up to us to win it or lose it by effectively assassinating all of the arguments of the other team, by making sure the clash areas decisively go our way. What is the reply speaker? The reply speaker is the scam. After we've made amazing trophy kills, after we've 
slaughtered all of the clash areas to our favor. The scavenger has to then be able to go to those bloody pulpy corpses of arguments and clashers and to show, look, look at this. This has been slaughtered, this clearly goes to us, this is our trophy, okay? And that's what we want to set up for the reply speaker, that he or she can indeed show magnificent trophies, okay? What is our case? Our case is our armory. It is the tools that we have ready in order to win the debate. Be they weapons, vehicles, what have you. The way we put our case and the way we prepare to react to potential things that are coming up are our weapons, are the essential things that whenever we will win, it will have been that we have won with these. So always, when building cases, don't just build it for the sake of building. We have to have a third argument. We have to have definitions. Always do it towards the purpose of providing yourself with weapons for going forward and winning when you have to kill. Okay? Have that in mind here. Questions so far? We're going to get into uh, techniques. Question, questions about this video. Fine. If that's all the initiative you have available, that is fine. Now, let's look at ways in which we kill during our kill time, during our eight minutes. Now, first of all, drawing, awful drawing aside, the most classical technique is shotgun. Shotgunning means essentially giving significant time to each and every, at least slightly important argument. Shotgunning means going to each thing, showing it's wrong. Next thing, show it is wrong. Next thing, show it is wrong. Next thing of yours, show it was essential. Next thing of yours, show it was very, very important. Shotgunning means having lots of areas you're going into in your third speech. And in some debates, it's the best idea, especially debates that are tactically widespread, that have a lot of areas, and you really can't determine which ones could be decisive. It's a comprehensive technique. Often, if you're dealing with a team that you feel has significantly lower content than you, then shotgunning might be a very good idea because your superior content would actually allow you to effectively just disassemble all of these areas. Okay? The next technique is sniper shooting. Sniper shooting means choosing one or two major areas and virtually dedicating all of your time to that. Sniper shooting is for those situations in which the debate seems to invest a lot into one significant area. And it is that those areas essentially become decisive, that they become the important ones, that anything else besides these one or two ideas seems to be random extra weight, but not actually essential to the question of debate. So you want to go for sniper shooting where there is a key, there is a clear key question, where you know if you convince them about this one thing, you win. And you want to show your sniper shooting. You want to let the judge know explain to the judge that you see that all of the weight is on that issue and it is that it is that issue that you will trophy kill within your speed. Don't say that, but if that is the point, show it explicitly <coughs> outline. Okay? Now similar to sniper shooting but not quite are Strategic demolitions. Now how strategic demolitions work is that if you have an enemy case, rather than that much engagement against the arguments themselves, you more rather try to attack the links. You more rather focus on showing whatever it is they may have proven is not relevant 
to winning the debate, to deciding for or against the motion. Strategic demolition means showing that either arguments, even if true, don't show that we should approve the motion, either that they're not sufficient, either that they don't apply, either that they don't logically follow. It's attacking the links and showing that, you know, it's fine that you invested that much in that argument, but even if it's true, it doesn't directly lead to the motion. Similar to that, in a way, is grenade usage. Now, as we know, grenades are, you know, this little ball of metal that explodes. But unlike what TV usually shows, it's not the explosion that does the problem, does the damage. It's the little shrapnel bits that fly everywhere. So essentially, when using a grenade, what you want to do is make a major counter-argument, or even a constructive argument. And if that is the type of argument that actually has direct consequences upon all of the debate, just by using that one specific argument throughout your speech, making it strong initially, show how it disassembles once established as true, everything else. Now, this is a high-risk strategy, because the question is, will the judge buy this one big argument or not? If they buy it, they will probably also agree that it's taken everything down. If they don't, we might lose the whole debate, okay? But then again, as a high-risk strategy, is also potentially a high-reward strategy, as in, if the judge does buy it, if we're feeling super confident that A, that argument is true, and two, that argument has implications about all of the areas we've been talking about, then it's fine to go for that and go win it that way. Again, you establish which technique you're using for each of the debates. Last but not least, is just driving your tank in. Now, driving your tank in essentially means heavily leaning upon your constructive. Means showing that what first speaker has begun solidly building and it's been solid. What second speaker has begun adding to and it's reinforcing and it has been solid, that you also focus on that machine that is your case, that major tank, and just driving it through, showing how that specific constructive argument that you've been building is so massive, is so solid, is so potent in getting into all of the areas that are relevant, and essentially focusing your energy on just driving through that, those initial points. It's important to show that you are interacting with the other team, that you're showing how the tank just drives through that one, drives through that counter-argument, drives through that construction of the other team. You have to make sure you show it. But again, if you're looking at a very solid case, especially a case that the other team hasn't exactly dealt with, and opposition teams will need that a lot, proposition teams will sometimes just ignore the opposition case or just give some uh, token counter-argumentations so that it doesn't seem they're not dealing with the opposition case. But some proposition cases and often opposition cases get ignored. This is not something uh, that you should just let happen. You should use it and drive that tank in. Now you can also use combinations of these techniques in some ways, in some situations. But definitely, like the big question, the big thing I want to leave you with is do consider what you're tactically doing. Do ask yourself, what am I doing? Even if it's something else other than these five somehow. It doesn't matter. Just Don't just go up there and say, and now I'm going to just deliver some counter arguments and say some stuff about our stuff. Have an actual tactical plan drawn up in your mind. Look at the outlay. Always make sure you have orientation of where the debate is going. Always assume responsibility for the fact that you should be making kills that you should be marking when you've won things. Mark when you think you've won things in your debate. It's fine, maybe you'll mark five kills, five trophies, 
and the judge will only recognize three. That's still better than not letting the judge know when you think you've made decisive arguments, okay? Questions so far? Questions? Are you all set to kill? Are you going to surely win every debate you'll ever play? If not, you should have questions. You are assassins, devastators of debates, and you have no questions. What we've been talking about, constantly being in sync with what's going on and having orientation and considering your tactics at all times, means you have, there you go. Uh, as the first speaker and second speaker say, we will talk about not following. Do we do that as well? So because it's basically bringing it up again. If it's useful, like our eight minutes, are our kill time, right? We're not gonna waste it on anything except killing. So if it helps to mark out the the uh, kill plan so that you know we first elegantly indicate that will die and then that will die and then we'll kill that. And then that's actually what we do. It might be great for just pointing out how awesome we're being, right? Uh, but if we're not gonna do that, then we shouldn't bother with it. But ideally, yeah, that's why it's good to give that initial outline and to give it briefly. Uh, don't waste too much of your time so that it's easy for the judge to see our trophies. Of course, all of the assassinating in this context is about trophy killing, is about visibility of the kill. Like, our scavenger will also help with that by showing, look what an awesome slaughter has been performed. But we also want to make sure the kill is in a clearly visible way. Yeah. Which type is you're using? For example, in shotgunning or sniper shooting, you're more rather looking at attacking first, at charging their stuff first, uh, also in demolitions. But in, for example, driving the tank in or grenade assaulting, it might be that you want to first look at some stuff you did, which might be a constructive grenade argument or simply reinforcing the case, then show how that interacts with the clashes overall in a broad sense. You don't, it doesn't have to be their stuff, our stuff. It can just be the talk about this, the talk about that, the talk about that other thing. And we're now dealing with it. So it doesn't have to be simply uh, a specific order necessarily. But again, the rule to all of this, whatever you want to do in terms of flexible structures, in terms of uh, showing what things directly link with one another, is clarity. Always clarity, the visibility of the guilt is what we want. So you always want to say, we are now dealing with that argument. Our, well, we are now dealing with this argument of ours. You want to show that these arguments essentially are happening. You don't just want to say stuff against their stuff and stuff in favor of your stuff. You don't want to be vague. You want to say, this is what is happening now. I am now dismantling that point. I have now proven that that is not true. I have now reinforced why you can't overcome this argument that we brought up. Always mark what you're doing, because that ensures your skills. More questions? Yeah. Uh, what happens if there is a major problem in their plan and your first and second speaker, speaker haven't dealt with it? Can you bring that up in the third speech? Or theirs or yours? Uh, in their plan. And your and your scout and dragon haven't addressed it yet? Like, the, the short answer is it depends. Especially because model stuff has more to do with the context part of the definition, if you mean a problem in their plan in a model sense. And you probably don't want to approach that if your teammates haven't addressed it at all. You probably want to just focus on other stuff because showing that there's a problem in the model beginning with third speech means they have no time to react to it. The judge can't be sure that's a kill because you've only started attacking late, so there was no time for reaction for defense, so we can't know that's a trophy kill that clearly because there was no time to react, to defend. That's how you want the kill. You want the kill with your team giving them plenty of opportunities to defend themselves and winning anyway. That's the clear kill. That's the clean one. That's what the judges will appreciate. That you have been challenging them all throughout and dominating all throughout on that flash. 
That's what you're looking for. Now, if you mean a problem with what they're doing uh, in a constructive sense within the arguments and not just a model thing, uh, in that case, it might be a good idea or not to approach it in the third speech. If it was something that was clearly attackable since their scout came up, yet uh, your guy didn't approach it, then be aware that it shouldn't be your main argument. You, you won't win the debate on something you've initially started. There was no scouting on it, there was no tracking on it, but you want to start dealing with it. You probably want to keep an answer so that it doesn't end the debate without you ever, ever having have touched it. But you don't want to try and win the debate on something you first approach on third speech, although it wasn't brief. Okay? So you probably, on arguments that your scout and tracker have missed, those idiots, you probably want to do some defense. You want to show you are interacting with that argument, but you're not likely to win. So you probably want to look at other stuff too. Then again, be aware that if they didn't bring it clearly from first, reapproached it in second, then you have more leeway. If it's an argument that first came up in second, it's fine to deal with it extensively on second. Even if you know your third opposition, your second opposition didn't react to it, it's still pretty okay to react to it. The question is how far away is it from where you're standing? Uh, also, if it's something like first speaker didn't bring it up, but nobody else reinforced it or re-mentioned it, and then you're up, uh, then again, there's more leeway. You could start talking about it a bit more permissively. More questions? Yeah? So, if the technique with the boundary has a higher risk, which is the safer but also good strategy? <clears throat> that, was, yeah. that, that was an exact sense. Grenades are not technically bombs, but yeah. well, let's not get into that. You mentioned about grenades. Um, Like, there is no one best strategy. That the point of this strategy is when you realize that the other team keeps building on assumptions. They make the initial assumption of, I don't know, something like uh, more participation, like thing you have to disagree a bit, more participation means better decisions, right? That's what they're saying. They don't even explain it that well. And then, when you want to talk about costs, you say, well, what about costs? And they say, well, you know, I understand how costs would there, but we're going to have better decisions in this society, so we're fine. And you ask, you know, but what about manipulation? Well, I know manipulation might be danger, but we're going to have better decisions because there's more participation. But, you know, what about, yeah, yeah, I get that, but, you know, because better decisions, there'll be less problems with that because the decisions are better. And they keep hinging over and over and over on the same thing. And you realize that, you know, without that one argument, everything else <laughs> comes falling down from, you know, the shrapnel. It all depends on that. When something like that happens, essentially that's what grenading is for. When actually their whole structure is hinging on one assumption, just hit that assumption hard. Further questions? It, it's not high risk when you literally have that situation. When you sort of have that situation, it is high risk, but potentially high reward. Don't do it if they actually have separate bulbs of argumentation that each one of them on their own could win the debate. And that's what you're looking to do as well. Not build on assumptions, but also have arguments that, you know, even if you defeat two of our three arguments, the argument left standing is still enough to win the debate in itself. So what you want typically when building is to have two or even three bulbs of argumentation, which if they get to the end, they win the debate in themselves. You don't want them to rely on each other, but rather any one argument that is left unaddressed by the end of the debate, it would win because it is a clear reason to propose, a clear reason to absolutely oppose. Okay? So make autonomous bulbs of argumentation. As you think of more questions, let's get into kill theory now. We've already looked at a lot of, we've already outlined a lot of this. What ensures kills? <coughs> Having powerful projectile bits that slash through the soft bits of the enemy to, you know, sever the functioning of vital organs. You know, that's what ensures maximum killability. 
And that's what you want in debate too. It's all about layers. It's all about getting in as many layers as possible. It's all about going as deep as possible. When you're constructing arguments or when you're counter-argumenting, that's always what you want. You want to go down as many levels as possible. You want to make sure that what you're doing has as many further logical levels as possible. Whenever you give an attack, saying that something is wrong, ask yourself why. Why is that thing they said wrong? Then give yourself the answer within your speech. Then ask why is the last thing I said, the explanation, also true. Explain the explanation. Ask yourself why is the explanation I just gave for the previous explanation true? Answer to that question. Because that gives you layers. When, when judges tell you things that you don't exactly understand, like there should have been more analysis, you should have gone more into that, what does that mean? Essentially, this is the answer. That's what it means. Get into as many further questions and further explanations on why the last thing you said is true. Why the last thing they said is wrong. They said this is wrong because people work like this. Why do people work like this? Because this is how their patterns of behavior work. Why are patterns of behavior like this? Because culture has been shaped in this way and this way. Why has culture has been, has been shaped in this way? Because we've had these following historical and contextual and cultural implications. Why have we had these? Because of economy and how things have worked and because of the trends we've had coming from specific ideological issues. Why has that happened? Okay? Yeah. I'm sorry, does that put us uh, kind of in danger of uh, losing the track? Because if we go too far away, how can we get back? How do we know we've explained it enough so we can just let it go and move on? We've never explained it enough, <laughs> is the answer. We've never, we're never done with it. Ideally, whenever we make a statement, we would get into a two-hour lecture about why our last statement is true. And ideally, we have to give the impression that, you know, should somebody someday in the debate give us two hours to deal with that, we seem totally ready to talk about that for two hours and show why it is true with a mass of explanations, implications, consequences, in many, many levels. Now, the risk of going into deep Showing that that uh, you know our, that, that our structure is is too tall. It's that's it's not only the way to think about it. The way to think about it is we're digging, and the deeper we dig, the more unlikely it is that they go deep enough to bomb. Because if we say things like explain all of that uh, all of that sequence that we talked about, and we get to the uh, Renaissance and talk about things that happened in the Renaissance that lead to current thinking and how people work, it's not going to be suffice for them to say, yeah, but it wasn't like that in the Renaissance, actually. The Renaissance was a bit more rough period. We're still definitely coming out on top. The only way in which we actually make, you know, a deep structure with many levels and many implications and many contingencies is actually typically that they deal with all of it. If we build it well, we have to deal with all of it. And it'll be harder when we've given so many levels and they're ready to actually address each and every level. And even if they try it, let's say they try it, okay? They try to especially look at one of the links. We show and we focus on the links they haven't done that. And really reinforce those, give some answer to their attack, and reinforce the rest. Whatever is left untouched, we want to transform each into a tank that wins. Each bomb that is unaddressed or addressed superficially, we want to take and make, you know, give it lots of kill value in further speeches, especially by the time we're in third. So layers, when counter-argumenting, go into as much depth. And don't just say, here's why they're wrong. If you're, for example, doing opposition, and you're saying, here's why this advantage doesn't actually happen, don't just say why the advantage doesn't actually happen. Go on to say, and here's the damage this makes. Like, even if there might be a bit of positive, we're showing that there's likely none. Here's the damage that this makes. Here's the consequences, the negative consequences. Oftentimes, simply, by trying to do something, by investing in doing something that just doesn't do a lot or doesn't do anything, that in itself is actually a negative because you are investing energy and change and lots of manpower and time into that thing without it producing a benefit. So always make sure that one, you're looking at what is being given to try that unlikely thing a proposition wants or avoiding to do that very useful thing that opposition refuses to change. 
And always ask yourself further, other than that, also, what consequences am I not thinking about? You don't want to be strictly reactive to the other team's opinion. Proposition doesn't just have to defend from what opposition is thinking about. Opposition doesn't just have to attack what proposition is doing. What you want to do is, other than that defense and those attacks, bring up further solid arguments that in themselves can build higher and higher, stronger and stronger. Whenever you've you know, made the, level, the, the ground level on an argument by showing this doesn't do that much, or um, you know, this, this does enough, go on further and say, but it does more, and here's why, and here's how, things that we haven't looked at yet. And again, on the opposite, not only does it do little or nothing, here's the massive damage that it does. You won't win the debates by just, you, you won't win good debates anyway by just reacting. You're going to win good debates by actually going in there and constructing your own solid arguments. More questions? Yeah. How much time should you spend with each deck? Well, since we have our eight minutes, really, as third speakers, the time allocation we have is the most flexible one. It could be anything like looking for two minutes at their stuff and six minutes at ours, when we're talking more rather about tanking, or it could be something like we want to in-depth go to their stuff for six minutes, which could be you know, any of these three and uh, give some, only uh, two or three minutes to our stuff. It really depends on the context. We have the highest burden of uh, not having any fixed time allocations. So what we're trying to do all of the time is to make sure that we can, um, that we can address the stuff that is essential. We have to pick our tactics, and time allocations come from whatever tactics we chose, be, be it these or something you specifically have thought of for that round. But the essential thing about that is do know before you're up there what your time allocation is. Write it down for yourself. I'm doing this for two minutes, I'm doing that for four minutes, I'm doing that for two minutes. Make sure you have it clear and make sure you stick to it. Because it's often on disciplined thirds that you know want to deal with lots of stuff and they feel really good and they're dealing with stuff and oh, the eight minutes are out before you've dealt with like two really important things. And you don't want to do that. You don't want to be that guy. Everybody hates that guy. Uh, what you want to do is to have a clear plan of what should be approaching. It should be the essential stuff. It should be the stuff that wins the debate. And be dealing with that for the exactly number of minutes you establish. You have eight. It's easy to divide those into whatever are the priorities and whatever tactics you use. More questions? Yeah. So is it okay to bring completely new arguments into third speech? The short answer is no. Technically speaking, a third proposition speaker could bring up another small constructive argument. That's never useful. Why? Because if you want to spend another three minutes on building a new argument in third proposition, you probably have less time for this stuff. And by this point, this stuff is pretty, pretty important, pretty decisive at that point. So you probably don't want to start building arguments at that point. However, the caveat to that is, while you have to make sure you don't do anything that is purely new, so nothing that is truly new, if there is any foundation of any sort placed by first speaker, by second speaker, you can definitely take that foundation already explained, already mentioned, already existing in some sub-argument or some argument, and build on it like it's nobody's business. Start tanking really hard on that specific argument, layering it really deep, and going on it a lot. But there has to be a clear foundation already existing in debate on that argument you want to tank on. You don't want to tank, you, you won't win by tanking on something that, was, that virtually wasn't there before. So as long as there's a clear, small but clear argument on it, we can tank. Yeah. Yeah, but what about when on the, in the second speech someone brought a new uh, third argument, for example, and then you came up and you should kind of bring something new in order to refute that argument? Well, like, we, we should distinguish between new arguments and refutation. It's fine to refute with something completely new. What I meant by, by, what is typically meant by new arguments is 
new constructive arguments, building a new view of why you should, for example, oppose this motion. Here's another reason why you should oppose the motion. You should never give an essentially new reason in the third speech. You should just develop on existing reasons to oppose or to propose. Uh, in reacting to the second speaker arguments, which you should definitely be doing, what that means essentially is that you're reacting to something that's already been put on the table. It's fine to develop on something your team or even theirs has put on the table. It counts as that foundation that I was talking about, okay? But it's fine to tank heavily against an argument as well, just as it is to, uh, acceptable to uh, layer in favor of one of your arguments. More questions? Yeah. So, are we allowed to look at things from a completely different point? For example, come with stakeholder analysis when it was not in the debate, but somehow we can use the argumentation which was there before to, to look at it. It's a tricky question. As in, since the rule is the foundation has to already have been there, if you make it seem like to reinforce our already existing argument, let's look at the stakeholders involved and see how that makes even more sense to our already existing argument, that's fine. If you instead do it as and now, six minutes of my speech will go to the section known as stakeholder analysis, although the concept of stakeholder analysis in practice or in theory has never shown up in your team. They don't seem like you're just doing a new argument, which you will arguably be doing. So essentially, you have to tie it to an already existing foundation. So do it, it, it's fine to do something like a, a, a heavy stakeholder analysis if uh, you're linking it to something existent not so much if you're doing it as a separate separate uh, new area not previously existed. Good. More questions? Yeah. How many questions should we as third speakers accept? Two or three. It depends a lot again on what we're trying to do. If we're going for I guess more comprehensive things like grenading, shotgunning and snipering in which we want to really engage with the content a lot and show how they're wrong every step of the way, that becomes an even more beautiful kill if we accept like three interventions from them and show, I'm ready to take on all of your challenges, I'll shotgun those, those down as they come anyway. So if we want to go, if you're doing comprehensive engagement with their stuff, if it's pretty solid stuff that we want to look at bit by bit without any exploitable flaws or without a major case to drive through, then yeah, we should be looking at three. If we're focusing more rather on severing some links and especially on insisting on our own stuff, then we probably want to take just two. We should never take one or four, really. We're looking at two or three. And the question two or three comes from how much we want to engage with our stuff. Taking three can show that I'm ready to engage. You should never see how that you're taking you know, your uh, third intervention because you don't have any stuff to say. You should take it in a bring it on kind of way. Bring it on, I'll deal with this, no problem. Kind of. More questions? You're all set to decisively kill? Some of you will be debating against each other, so that, that's why I'm asking. More questions about how to do your job as third, anything and everything. Yeah, the summers tell me that I should improve my structure. And but when you said that okay, okay, you have eight minutes and you can use it whatever you want. And I sometimes got lost in those eight minutes like jumping from one, one point to one to another point. How should we I don't know any anything to say about that? Like as I said earlier, assassination is all about discipline. So when we have, you know, our eight minutes We should know what is happening in We can literally make a mind map of eight little squares on our paper and just write in this is happening here, also dealing this here, starting on this here, more of this here, quick something on this one, uh, then we want to do this. I'll close up with you know the principal outlook on that. Literally do your map. And if you've done your map of what you're doing when, that can get even more pretty by saying, today I'll be looking at X, Y, 
I'll be mentioning something about Z, looking heavily on A, and closing off with a few mentions on B. If you make your plan, announce your plan, then truly execute your plan, and it's like not crap otherwise, then you will gain structure points and strategy points simply for the clarity of what you're doing, simply for the fact of having a plan. The moment, because, you know, judges have to be objective, Ju judges have to be reactive. But part of emphatic communication, part of convincing, is letting people also think for themselves. When you're giving the judge a structure of what you want to be doing, the judge will already have lights firing off of what this counter-argumentation, what this third speech probably is going for. And you want that. You want anticipation, intellectual anticipation to exist. Because when there is intellectual anticipation of what's coming up, the judge is a lot more in favor of listening to your point of view, of being open to your point of view, of being in sync with the arguments you're giving and the way you're giving it. Giving it. So always, to be structured, have this third. No judge will be able to reproach anything on structure if literally you told them what you're doing, essentially minute by minute, actually did it, actually named, now dealing with their X, now dealing with their Y, now mentioning something about Z, now doing my A, and down, done now doing my A, a closing mention on B, done with B. If you do it explicitly, if you always show what you're doing, when you're doing it, signposting it, having announced it previously and doing it for exactly the number of minutes you've dealt with, you, you said you will on your paper, then you will always be fine and strong. It's obviously very challenging because it comes down to sentences. One more sentence means all of the timing goes off. You also have time to signpost. Part of these eight minutes is, part of these two minutes for X is announcing that you're starting on X is announcing that you're done with X and moving on to Y. So you have to also take these transfer moments into account. And all of these tactical implications that you have to point out. I'm now doing sharpening, I'm stacking this, the grenade has these implications, so on and so forth. But if you pull it off, it's brilliant. And to the question, should I deal with this more, even though it's not how I lot of my time, but it's really important, the question actually typically is no. Put your first minute and a half forward when you want to deal with something for two minutes. And if you're out of time, just go to the next thing. Do it elegantly, do it with flow. But essentially, just hit it with your best minute and a half. Even if you have six minutes worth of hitting it, take the best one minute and a half and just hit it with that. And move on to the next thing, as you said in your structure, as you established in your paper. I'll give you a lot more control. And even if initially you'll have that annoying moment of oh, so much more to see about this, and you move on to the next thing, and I can totally see it on your face when you're debating, and uh, I know you've essentially fudged your uh, time plan, it's fine. If you start imposing this discipline upon yourself, it gets a lot easier, it becomes natural, it lets you have an 8-minute speech. The point of this 8-minute speech is not, we would like to talk for 20 minutes, but we're going to squeeze it into 8. If that's the vibe you're giving me, like you would have needed 20, but you squeezed it into 8, that's something that will suggest to me rather a, a, a little, little less strategic awareness, less stylistic joy. What I want instead is to say, no, it is exactly an 8 minute demonstration that does the perfect kill in this speech, third speeches or otherwise. You have to give me the impression that it's exactly 8 minutes you need to give the essential and important arguments that need to be given, and no more. It's exactly eight minutes. You want it exactly at eight. That's the vibe you want to give. There was a question. Um, how much time should we actually leave for POI? Because we don't know when they're going to come up. I can pretty much say POI 1 goes here, POI 2 goes here. And when we're in that area, see what's coming up. If it's, if it's an okay round, a fairly direct round in which enough points are being offered, we're going to take it around that window that we established. And there is going to be one offer. Think about it, there is typically a QI offered in a, a good round, at least every 30 seconds. We do have like six offers during those six minutes, typically, at least a lot of times more. So we can actually pretty much establish when we're taking POIs in this context. Also, of course, it's challenging. Like, we probably wanted to be asking a question for 10 seconds and to have dealt with it within 20 seconds or less. But oftentimes, it's a bit harder. 
what you want to do again is more rather keep to your plan rather than go into a lot of debt. Because if they really have succeeded, and when you're offering POIs, that you want to do, you want to destabilize the other guys with the POI. You want to give a POI to which the answer takes 40 or 50 seconds. That's a great POI. If they have to deal with your POI for 40 or 50 seconds, you've just like totally thrown off their plan because their plan should be something like this if they even have one. And if you manage to give them a POI that takes 40, 50 to deal with, great, okay? So that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to ask the hard questions that can't be just, yeah, no, and I move on. You want to ask questions that if they were to say, yes, no, I don't think so, they would seem like they're a clear loss for not having dealt with that. Again, it, you know, before the end, it's also a lot about practice. The more we practice this, the easier it becomes. And it is a challenge, but you know, have the challenges clear. Have the structure clear, have the layer of the land clear, have your tactics established before you go out there. More questions? No? You're all set? Ready to do killing? Ready to win stuff? Good. Third speakers, it's all on you. Good luck out there. Show them what you're made of. Keep discipline. Get the trophy kits. Good luck. <laughs>